this morning we begin our, our, summon, our summer series of testimonies. And this morning we have Tom Trotta, uh, who's going to come up and bring his testimony and point towards the gospel while doing so. Uh, I've been here now for two and a half years as your pastor, and Tom Trotta is one of the first people to come off the street and into my office after arriving here as a pastor. Uh, he came in and sat down in my office and told me he was a Gideon, and I lit up because my grandfather was a Gideon, so we had a connection from there. And soon he and his wife, Murray, would be looking for a church, and they found First Christian Church of the Beaches to be their church home. If you've lived out here on the beach for any amount of time, you might know Tom and Murray as they have been deeply invested in this community where they live for decades now. And so with that, I want you to give your attention and, and your hearts to the message Tom has for us this morning. Well, God says in the Bible, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I please and prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. And that certainly turned out to be true in my life, although not at first. I was raised in New York City by good parents. I went to a parochial school, was told to go to church on every Sunday. In fact, uh, they'd know if I didn't go to church on Sunday. I was taught right from wrong. I knew them both and did one more than the other. Uh, and I remember that my home did not have a Bible in it. If it did, I didn't know where it was because we didn't talk about spiritual things in my house. And that just seemed normal not to speak about spiritual things. Um, didn't know what a Bible was, really, although I did know some Bible stories. In 1956, we moved from the big city of New York to the little city of Atlantic Beach, Florida. And my wife lived right up the street. I didn't, hadn't met her yet. Uh, I went to Fletcher, as did she. And um, I went to church a little bit. Still did not have a Bible, did not really have a Christian witness. Oh, yes, I knew who Jesus was. I'd heard the stories. Um, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Is that right? We all know that. But that's history. Salvation is Jesus Christ came into the world to save Tom Trotta, and I didn't know that. So I went off to the University of Florida, and back in 1960, Florida was pretty godless, so you can imagine how it is today. Didn't go to church, I think, but once in four years. Did not have a Bible, did not have a Christian witness or a gospel witness, and, uh, and then went into the Air Force in 1964 and married Miss Murray uh, in 1965. A few years later, in 1972, I found myself in Tampa training to fly the, the F-4 Phantom Jet, and uh, it was an upgrading class, and there were a lot of people in there, uh, mostly captains and majors who had flown in other airplanes, and there was one second lieutenant in there, and uh, that was a little odd, but he was more mature than most. He'd married, and he befriended me. And his name was Ed DeBee. I'll never forget Ed. I wish I could find Ed today, but I think the Lord's taken Ed home. But Ed was a little different because Ed was a Christian, but he didn't jam it down your throat. But Ed knew that married people who weren't with their wives, because Murray was going to school here, liked to eat, so he invited me to his house for an occasional breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But he had a, he had a shelf full of Bibles. And I couldn't imagine why a man would have more than one Bible, even if he had one. But Ed had one that was large print, one that was a study Bible, one that he could write in, one that he could take the pages out of. And I said, Ed, why do you have so many? Well, Ed said something back to me that got at my vanity. Not right away, but he said, you haven't read the book that sold more books than any book in the world, and you're a college graduate? My answer to that had to be no, because I hadn't read it. I didn't even own one, nor did I want to own one. One day I saw him out in the parking lot down in Tampa talking to my wife, and I was wondering, why don't they get it over with so we can get back home? Because you know guys, they, they're in a hurry. They're very focused. Well, they stayed out there, which seemed like forever. And I found out later what they were talking about is Ed had told my wife, why don't you buy Tom a Bible? Well, it's a good thing he didn't ask me to buy me a Bible because I never would have done it. But he asked my wife, and in Christmas of 1972, she presented me with a Bible. 
And that July, I headed off to Korea, didn't go to Vietnam because that's not where God wanted me. He wanted me in Korea for a year, unaccompanied. But I went with my Bible, got there. It was the hottest place I've ever been in the world. But the first Sunday, I knew that I was away from home. I needed to be in church, so I went to church. A few weeks later, a major knocked on my door from my squadron and said, hey, I'd like to invite you to a Bible study. Well, I didn't know what a Bible study was. It scared me a little. Uh, I did have a Bible, but I said, what time? He said, nine o'clock. I said, I go to church at nine o'clock. He said, well, we go to church at 10. I said, not me. I go at nine. Well, this fellow was smarter than most, and I learned from him. He was persistent, patiently persistent. And one day he came by and said, sure, would like to have you come to that Bible study. And I said, I can do that this morning. And we walked into a big room and I will never, things you remember, I will never forget. I went into a room and here is a room full of men sitting around a table <clears throat> and they've all got Bibles. More surprising is that one over there is the chief of maintenance for the squadron. That one over there is my reporting official and other men from my squadron. And right then and there, I started my, my learning in going to just a Bible study. And uh, things began to happen. Now, when you go to Korea unaccompanied, fighter squadrons are wild, crazy. They party a lot and they drink a lot. And I'll never forget in December, December the, about the 14th to be exact, a fellow in my squadron who was a bachelor was supposed to have his mid-tour leave. You stay for six months, you get to go home for two weeks, and then you come back and you finish. Well, my mid-tour leave didn't start till February, but he hadn't made any plans yet. So I said, Where, what are you going to do? Are you going to meet your girlfriend in Hawaii? Are you going to meet her in San Francisco? What are you going to do? Because it's December, your time's coming up, and you're not going to be able to get off this rock if you don't make some plans. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. That didn't work with me because um, you got a plan. So finally, I looked him in the eye and said these crazy words after a big party. I said, you know, you ought to... Uh, Take my mid-tour leave in February and let me go home on your mid-tour leave in two weeks. What do you think? A bachelor. He said, okay. Okay, you can have my mid-tour leave. The most, that's not normal for a bachelor to do that. And God was working, and yet I still didn't see it. But I knew the next day, a Sunday, I needed to get some plane reservations. So I ran down to where you get tickets and said, get me home. And so they did. And the big part of the flight was I flew all these stops and I go from Chicago to Jacksonville. That was good. About five days later, to make sure that this hadn't fallen through, I went back and said, ticket's still good, nothing fallen through. Oh, by the way, that flight from Chicago to Jacksonville, not operating. You will go Chicago, Atlanta, Jacksonville. That's okay. Five days later, God, God's not going to let me mess this up. I said, is flight still good? They said, yeah, and by the way, that Chicago flight's operating again. I said, well, what should I do with the other one? I remember the fellow saying, just keep it as a backup. December 26th, I got on an airplane to go home, flew all these stops. When we got to Chicago, what did we do? Anybody here been to Chicago? You circle when you get to Chicago. You don't land. You just circle for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. We circled for about an hour, and I got a flight that leaves right now. And I figured since my flight's late, every flight's late. Wrong. When I got on the ground, my flight had been gone an hour that went Chicago to Jacksonville. And I remembered, he said, use that other flight as a backup. <clears throat> and I looked right here, and it said boarding, Chicago to Atlanta. Got on the flight, not realizing that God had worked that out as well. And got to Atlanta, and when I got to Atlanta, I said, I want to go on this flight to Jacksonville. He said, well, you got to go all the way into the terminal and get another ticket because you're on the wrong airline. I said, well, I don't have time. The clock's running. They said, well, we can't let you on this airplane. I remember walking from one end of the Atlanta airport to the other into the terminal, getting there, and the fellow writing the ticket out, and then he said those words we all love to hear, your standby. <laughs> I said, standby? I might not get on the flight. He said, that's right. I said, but my wife's going to meet me at the airport. He said, well, you want me to call her and have her come? I said, I don't want her to come to the airport in the middle of the night if I'm not going to be there. And right then and there, brothers and sisters, I heard God speak to my heart. He said, do you think I'd get you this far and not get you home? I got on the airplane. I got home. All I saw when I got home were believers. All I wanted to do was go to church. All I wanted to do was read the Bible. I was different. And then another thing happened. 
Before I went back to Korea, I went to a lady friend's house who was the mother of a, a, a girl that Murray knew, her maid of honor and a friend of mine, just to say hello. And when I got there, she was having, you ready? A prayer meeting. A women having a prayer meeting, whatever that is. And so I said hello to the ladies and I said goodbye. And she said, do you mind if we pray for you before you go back to Korea? I said, no, I don't mind. I'll never forget it. She sits me in a chair right in the middle of the dining room. Bunch of women surround me, lay their hands on me, and they prayed. And I heard her say, send this man back to Korea, a mighty witness for you. And it happened. I went back a different person. I went back and my squadron members knew something had happened to me and wanted to hear about it. I went back and played Christian tapes over the PA system in a fighter squadron. You don't do that. I mean, the whole world was hearing it. I was in church every night. It was kind of neat. You had the Pentecostals one night, the Methodists one night, the Episcopalians one night, the Baptists one night. It was great. I remember a Methodist pastor. Now, I'm not a smart guy, so I don't know. All I know is that he's a Methodist. What can he know, right? Boy, he knew a lot. And I still remember his message from 44 years ago. And his text was, go back to Bethel from Genesis 6 or 7. I never forgot it. I couldn't wait to hear the gospel preached. Then another night, I was sitting there and they said, we're going to take up an offering tonight. God was just teaching me. We're going to take up an offering tonight for Brother Cho. Brother Cho wants to build a tent, get a tent for outside the front gate so he can witness to the Koreans there. And he needs money for a tent. Now, there's about 30 people in this church service, mostly enlisted. He said, we need $350 for Brother Cho's tent. And we'll just collect every Sunday until we get $350. I thought, well, that's going to take a while, but you got the right idea. So let's pray about it. One guy raises his hand and says, I think we can get the $350 tonight. And I'm thinking, you're nuts. <laughs> there ain't enough people here to get $350. And another fellow says, I think we can too. So they had a prayer, passed the plate. When it was over, they said, we have more than enough money to buy Brother Cho his tent. And God showed me again, I'm in charge of all this. I'm running this. And then one day as I sat in that church, as you're sitting there now, the Lord showed me himself sitting in the back of the church, just sitting kind of like you are, Brother Nathan, just watching his children worship. It was just kind of a vision. I could see him just enjoying us, enjoying him. I was told while I was there that there was a group called the Navigators. Anybody heard of the Navigators? Well, I was a navigator, an Air Force navigator, and the pilots in the Air Force have a club called the Dedalians. And if you know your Greek mythology, Daedalus made wings out of feathers and put wax on them and flew too close to the sun and it melted and he fell to the ground. But we didn't have, navigators didn't have a group. So I said, I thought it was Air Force navigators, you know, the plot of course. No, this was a Christian group. And I remembered that, navigators. So anyway, I came back to the United States, started to read the, my Bible more and more and tell people about Jesus. I learned about the navigators. I got a scripture memory course. They're big into scripture memory. And while I was in Charleston and my wife was here going to school, I just memorized scripture back and forth on 95. And what does the word say? I have hid thy word in my, in my heart that I might not sin against you. Hide the word in your heart. In 1972, here I am in, uh, in Illinois, sitting at my desk. I should probably tell you that we had a prayer group there. I got into prayer, all kinds of nonsense, huh? Me, me who used to like to drink beer all the time and now go into prayer meetings. Um, and so we started a prayer meeting in this headquarters group at lunchtime. And somebody came by to see me one time and uh, we hadn't gotten a name for our group. And he said, where's Trotta? Is he here? Somebody said, no, he's at the prayer meeting over there. He's, he's, the guy said, you mean that Jesus Christ for lunch bunch? And that became our name. We adopted that as our name, the Jesus Christ for a lunch bunch. And it went all through the squadron. God has a ways of making witness. But one day, a fellow walked into my office and he was a second lieutenant. God uses second lieutenants, you know. He comes in my office and he says, I just joined the Gideons. And I said, that's good. I'm pretty busy. So um, I got to get back to work. Six months later, he came back with the same excitement. And he said, the local Gideons made me the president. I said, wait a minute, come over here. I said, who are the Gideons? I, I've never heard of the Gideons. He said, Gideons are Christian business and professional men. I said, great, what do you do? He said, all we do is tell people about Jesus and hand them free scriptures. I said, I can do that. 
I can do that. So about 39 years ago, I joined the Gideons because I wanted people to know how powerful God's word was. Powerful. And uh, I've been doing it ever since. And, and it's been a joy because God does the heavy lifting. You know, I learned that Christ died for me. And I learned because people talk to me, they witness to me, because my wife bought me a Bible, because Ed DeBe said, buy him a Bible, because Ed DeBe was smart enough to know I'd never buy him on my own. So that said, know that the word of God is powerful. We leave it places and people pick it up. And sometimes they just pick up pages. Sometimes they read the whole thing. Sometimes they go to shoot themselves in motels. And instead they pick up the word and instead of taking a life, they give a life. And so it's, it's been my calling for the last year. And I've been God's fool ever since. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm not ashamed of it because, because the gospel is the most important thing anyone can ever know. So the thought I left with the, with the first service that I leave with you is please read your Bible every day. If you've never read it, I'll look you all in the eye. If you've never read it from Genesis to Revelation, I challenge you to do that. Just read a little bit every day and it will change your life for the better. And you will know then more than that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, that Jesus Christ came into the world, if you don't already know it and enjoy it, to save you by name. God bless you.